This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. On today's show, Ira Shapiro was a Senate staffer in the 1970s, and he looks back in a highly regarded new book on that time, which he calls The Last Great Senate. He tells us why it was so great and why it isn't anymore. Ray Glendening is a young political operative who has established a website for people of all ideological persuasions to meet other people who share their views. The platform is called Ruckus, and he explains how it works. And Bill Press talks with Jennifer Duffy of the Cook Political Report on Democratic prospects for retaining a Senate majority. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the fact you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. From the early 1960s through the 1970s, the United States Senate lived up to its historic grandeur, says former Senate staffer Ira Shapiro, the author of a new book called The Last Great Senate. What went wrong? Shapiro suggests it was the outside influences of right-wing ideology and big money that turned the world's greatest deliberate body into a permanent election campaign. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Ira Shapiro, who came to Washington in 1975, spent 12 years working in senior positions in the Senate, playing important roles in accomplishments as diverse as the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the Senate Code of Ethics, and completing the Metrorail system. During the Clinton administration, he served as a leading U.S. trade negotiator, ultimately earning the rank of ambassador, and is the author of The Last Great Senate, Courage and Statemanship in Times of Cry Crisis. Ira Shapiro, thanks very much for joining us today. Jim, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, we enjoy your time with us. The Last Great Senate um, almost sounds like an oxymoron, uh, but when was it great, and why was it so great then? Jim, when I refer to the last great Senate, I'm referring to the Senate of the early 60s through 1980. For an almost 20-year period, I think we had a Senate that loomed very large in our country. And it was a Senate that was different, certainly, than the sorry Senate we have now. But it was also different than any Senate that had come before it. And I think it was on the sort of on the forefront of everything that was going on in the country during a turbulent period of time. Were those years so great because it was a more progressive era and a more progressive body than before or since? Well, it certainly started out as a more progressive era. Uh, it started with President Kennedy and then President Johnson. And the Senate was a progressive body. There's no question it was largely Democratic uh, progressives who had come there in the 50s and the early 60s. Uh, and the Republicans were, of course, far more, many more progressives and far more moderates than there are today. And I think that there's such a bias in our government system against action. We separate powers so as to make sure it's difficult for government to act. So in a sense, you do need uh, sort of a progressive orientation to overcome that kind of bias against action. And that's what we saw in that Senate. But the other thing I would add is that Senate that I refer to as the Great Senate, even as the country came out of what I would call the progressive period, the Senate kept them on a more progressive track through the 70s. You were a staff member to several senators, and, and you point out in the book how many future government leaders were Senate staffers. Do you think staff plays too great a role in the legislative and political process? No, I don't. Uh, I would say that if you look back on the Senate when it worked well, uh, the staff was very, very uh, highly qualified, very energetic, uh, we had a lot of Harvard, Yale, Columbia lawyers and great journalists and economists running around because they were drawn to the Senate. 
they wanted to work in a place that had large figures doing something in the public interest. They knew they could be entrusted to do something at an early age, but they also, I think all of us knew our limits. And so I think that the staff was part of the success of the great Senate and the great senators, the best ones knew how to use staff to expand their influence, the senator's influence. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Ira Shapiro, author of The Last Great Senate, Courage and Statemanship in Times of Crisis. If I, could just, if I could just add, Jim, yeah. uh, you know, I sometimes get accused of being too general. The kind of staff people we had up there then wandering the halls included Madeleine Albright and Tom Daschle and Susan Collins and Stephen Breyer. Uh, Senator Kennedy's judiciary staff at one point had a future chief, uh, future justice of the Supreme Court, Breyer, probably the best litigator in the United States years later, David Boyce, and the best mediator, uh, Ken Feinberg, all at the same time. That's kind of a who's who in Washington, right? And, they, and, and, and I think all of us feel we trained in the right place. It made a huge difference for the rest of our careers. Is there a senator from that era who, who you're willing to say was the best or even the worst? Um, but you, we'll put be, you on the spot a little bit. <laughs> well, you can put me on the spot. I, 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 but there were there were probably eight or ten that we would regard universally as great, and so I won't give you one, but I'd give you four names very quickly. Hubert Humphrey, who was probably the most creative legislator. Uh, he actually, as a senator, in virtually invented the modern senator, connecting the issues of the day with the mass public or across the country in a way it hadn't been done before. He was later very much tarnished by his association with the Vietnam War as vice president, but he was a great, great senator. Mike Mansfield, the majority leader for 16 years, did more to set the tone of the Senate and create a Senate based on mutual trust and respect and bipartisanship. Jacob Javits was perhaps the most superb legislator of his time, a great lawyer and universally recognized that way, Republican from New York. And Howard Baker of Tennessee epitomized the courage and statesmanship that I refer to in the book. Baker as leader opposed, uh, sorry, Baker, as leader, supported the Panama Canal treaties suggested by Jimmy Carter, even though he knew it would cost him any chance of being president. So I'd say those four, in the post-1980 period, a little later, I would point to Ted Kennedy and Robert Byrd. In terms of worst, I would single out as the most destructive influence on the Senate in my view, Jesse Helms, because, and I'm not disputing the depth of Senator Helms' conviction, but Senator Helms obstructed the work of the Senate, and he turned the Senate into more of an extension to the, of the national Republican conservative movement. He broke down the wall between the, the Senate and the outside politics of the country in a very destructive way. That sounds a little bit like what we're facing right now. Well, it is what we're facing right now, but the problem is the Senate that I write about, the 60s and the 70s, with even a focus on the late 70s, the walls against pure partisanship were very high. It was really almost a demilitarized zone where partisanship was concerned. Helms represented the beginning of a change. The Senate resisted that change. It was strong enough to resist that change pre-1980, but over time it succumbed mm -hmm. and became part of this sort of permanent campaign. We're speaking with Ira Shapiro here on AmericasDemocrats.org. He's the author of The Last Great Senate, Courage and Statemanship in Times of Crisis. Uh, what was the greatest achievement of the Senate? I mean, passing civil rights laws, investigating Watergate, stopping the Vietnam War... Well, I would say 
if I was going to point to the three greatest uh, and signal accomplishments of the Senate, I would say that those are the three. They they collaborated with President Johnson on the historic Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, and then the Civil Rights Act of 68, which was very difficult, dealing with discrimination in housing, uh, as the country had already turned to the right. You can't think of the opposition to the war in Vietnam without thinking about the Senate, the Fulbright hearings in 1966 that started to turn the middle class against it, and then the efforts to stop the funding for the war uh, in, from 1969 on. Watergate, I think, showed the Senate at its best a nonpartisan investigation of the abuses of the Richard Nixon presidential campaign started weeks after, only weeks after the Nixon landslide of 1972, the Democrats and Republicans set up a special committee, select committee to investigate Watergate. You can't envision that happening now. And the Senate distinguished itself in that regard. Let's talk a little bit about when things really started to change in Congress into what is today's mess. I mean, is is it 1980? Is it or is it a is it a grayer area of that? And and then why did it happen? I would cite two. I would cite two stages. Um, 1980, which is where the narrative of my book ends, mm-hmm. was a shattering election for the Senate. The Reagan landslide swept out a number of the most experienced and accomplished legislators of their time, Birch Bayh, George McGovern, Gaylord Nelson, Abe Ribicoff retired, Ed Muskie left, Jack Javits lost. Um, So there was a huge change, and they were replaced by very neophyte, very conservative Republicans. That was the shattering of the great Senate. But the story wasn't done yet. I think the Senate came back together in the 1980s and looked pretty much like a workable Senate in the mid to late 80s. There were a lot of good senators there. That was the period of sort of Sam Nunn and John Danforth and Lloyd Benson. A lot of good senators uh, still knowing how to do business. Things got rapidly worse in the 90s, and particularly after the Republicans took over the Congress in 94. Newt Gingrich and his Senate allies, led by Trent Lott, changed the Senate dramatically. Uh, I like to say that Senator Lott brought over, hand-carried the toxin over from the House, made it into a more partisan institution in a very short time. In 1996, you will see a significant outflow of the remaining Republican moderates, as well as some very good Democratic moderates. The Senate changed very abruptly right about then, and it's never recovered. Mm-hmm. Now, Ira, before we let you go, we're going to have you do a little prognosticating. Uh, what do you think the Senate would be like in 2013 should Governor Romney win the election, and conversely, if the president is reelected? I hope that whoever's elected uh, is going to have a Senate that tries to work in a more constructive way with the president. Um, I think what we have seen during the Obama presidency was a dramatic departure from the way the Senate used to function when I wrote about it. I always thought that in times of national crisis, the Senate would be Uh, in the forefront of coming together on a bipartisan basis. And that simply didn't happen when Barack Obama became president during a national economic crisis. The Republicans completely obstructed his agenda. Um, I think if Obama's elected, I hope the Republicans will be more cooperative uh, in the next four years. I think if Romney's elected, I hope that the Democrats will prove a constructive check on some of his excesses. 
but won't get into total payback so that the government doesn't work for yet another four years. We simply can't have a situation where the camp permanent campaign just goes on and there's never any time for anyone to govern. Mm-hmm. That's exactly, and that's where we are now. I was just going to say, that's exactly that's what it is. That's where we are now. Yeah, that's exactly what it is going on now. Ira Shapiro is the author of The Last Great Senate, Courage and Statesmanship in Times of Cri- Crisis. Ira, thank you so much for your time with us today. We look forward to having you back here on americasdemocrats.org. Oh, thanks for having me, Jim. Much appreciated. All right. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up in just a few minutes, Ray Glenn Denning, the founder of a new website for postpartisan political discourse, tells us how he sees a new generation possibly moving beyond the political party structure. But right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Such energy powers as BP, ExxonMobil, Halliburton, and Coke Industries have gone crackers over fracking. Seeing huge profits from this dreadfully destructive and dangerously dirty method of forcing natural gas out of rock formations deep in the earth, the industry is presently scurrying all over the country, asking landowners to sign contracts, allowing them to drill and frack on farms, parkland, playgrounds, and even people's backyards. But now, in cities and rural areas alike, this unbridled gas rush has become a matter of deeply grave concern. Literally. In the shriveled ethical universe of these fracking profiteers, money trumps everything, and nothing is sacred. Not even graveyards. The eternal resting place of our loved ones. Yes, gas frackers across the country are out to get drilling rights in hundreds of cemeteries, promising maintenance money to caretakers in exchange for letting the corporations sink their explosive siphons down under the dearly departed. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and mineral rights to Exxon. How spiritual. Oh, come on, snap the industry's impatient hustlers. The fracking takes place way underground, so it won't disturb the graves. Yeah, but what about the souls? A cemetery is a spiritual sanctuary, a place of respect, serenity, and moral decorum. But a fracking corporation has no soul, and its moral concerns penetrate no deeper than its bottom line. For a measure of just how shallow corporate morality is, note that the frackers even threaten the hallowed ground of some of our veterans' cemeteries. Their ethos is clear. Hey, out of the way, decorum is one thing, but there's money under those graves. This is Jim Hightower saying they're fracturing our deepest values. To fight this, go to foodandwaterwatch.org. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. A new Internet site tries to match up ideological soulmates regardless of political party. The founder of this post-partisan exercise, Ray Glenn Denning, explains how this new platform may bring about a broad and thoughtful conversation about the role of government. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Raymond Glendening is a co-founder at Ruckus Incorporated, an online organizing platform. Ray Glendening is the former national political director of the Democratic Governors Association. Ray, thanks very much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. It's my pleasure to be here. Your social organizing platform called Ruckus, and that's uh, www.ruck.us, well over a year old now. How's it been working? 
it's been working very well. Uh, we've been very encouraged. You know, I think that politics, interestingly enough, has really lagged in terms of um, how the markets have uh, made um, you know different components of our life more modern. We, uh, if we want to find a restaurant, we just we just pop onto our iPhone or or BlackBerry and find it in two seconds. If we if we want some music, we're on iTunes in three seconds. If we want to book travel, the exact same thing. Literally every component of our lives has been updated by technology, except for our political engagement. And so Nathan and I, are, uh, my co-founder, just thought that that was um, very antiquated and it was something that was bound to be uh, updated. And that um, it's it's interesting that you know one of the most important things in all of our lives, because I think to some degree we're all political, has still been living um, in 20th century uh, engagement models. So. We created Ruckus where uh, it's an online engagement platform where you come on, select issues that are relevant to you, whether it's one or a hundred, answer a few questions that are about um, you know, the contemporary and, and relevant political topic, the topics that are happening, and then we match you with a uh, group of like-minded people, politically speaking. So you may not know them, and uh, you probably don't actually know them, but it's people that have said, oh, you care about education? I care about education as well. You care about torture at Guantanamo. I care about that as well. So we're giving you your own personable, immediate, actionable political network right away. You know, a lot of online forums tend to be taken over by extremists of one sort or another. Is there a way to prevent that sort of thing on ruckus? No, you know, I, I think that any time you're talking about politics, especially in America, you know, we've, we've always been um, very passionate about our politics. Um, based on, uh, you know, kind of where we came from. But I think that, to your point, you know, civility has really gone down um, over the course of the last decade or so. So I don't think that you're ever going to be able to prevent people, um, you know, with, with uh, inflamed rhetoric. I think you can really foster a positive environment and encourage people to uh, find commonality on issues when you strip away a lot of the traditional labels that are affiliated with politics. So if you can take away you know, Tea Party or Occupy Wall Street or take away conservative right winger or uh, liberal left winger. I think that you take away a lot of the, you know, mental uh, connotations that you have um, with people and you find out um, that there's a lot more in common than there is uh, that separates us. And, and that's the type of environment that we're trying to foster at Ruckus. And I think we've been relatively successful in doing so. We're speaking with Ray Glendening, co-founder at Ruckus Incorporated, the uh, online organizing platform. President Obama won the last election with very strong support from young voters. Uh, have you seen evidence that they'll be back this year, or are you seeing more disenchantment? What kind of feeling you know, are you getting it, on Ruckus? You know, it's really I, it's going to be interesting to see, um, is, is a short way to put it. You're exactly right. He was propelled... Um, by that under 25 crowd. And um, I think that everybody uh, from all ideological backgrounds was uh, very encouraged just to see the younger generation plugging in politically because um, in the years before it was frankly a, a generation that was lagging in terms of their political engagement. Um, you know, this is the one potential downside is this is an instant gratification generation. Um, if if somebody you know needs to switch something on their banking, they can do it immediately. If somebody wants to watch a movie, wherever it may be, they can do it immediately. And so I think people are uh, much more used to having things um, turn around for them right away. Um, and that's just not the way that that politics works, and it's certainly not the way that Washington works. So I think it's going to be interesting from a political science perspective just to see you know, how much, if any, fall off there is. My sense is um, that there's going to be some. How much is really, I think, going to dictate um, where the election ends up, because, as you know, I think it's probably razor thin right now. Mm -hmm. What about trending topics on ruckus? What are you, what are you seeing are sort of the, the hot conversations going on? You know, it's, it's a little bit more of a kind of a 30,000-foot um, conversation that's been happening on our site. Um, I think that whereas past elections and, and past conversations politically have been on, um, you know, specific kind of trending topics to steal your uh, term, say Iraq or abortion or the death penalty or guns, you know, I think that, 
America over the course of the last 12 months and certainly going forward has been having a much broader conversation about what do we want government to do? You know, what, what are we tasking government to do? What country do we want to be and how do we want to get there? And I think, um, you know, it's been stimulating to watch because you see people thinking about um, government and, and, and kind of the fibers of our country and, you know, that's very encouraging. At the same time, um, you know, it's, it's also brought a lot of the, uh, the division that we have in the country right now. So we've seen, I think, a much kind of a, a much more thoughtful and philosophical conversation on ruckus um, than just say this, this issue or that issue. Mm. Now, you used to work for the Democratic National Governors Association, as I mentioned at, at the top. How important would you say is the election of Democratic governors, even if the president were to lose? You know, I think um, what, one of the things that's always um, attracted me to, to governors and working with governors is that you have to have a, uh, a much more pragmatic approach to being an executive. And I think that's, you know, one of the reasons that people also dial in so much for the presidential election. Um, when you're electing an executive, you're not, you know, electing – um, you know, one person to join a legislative body, um, you know, that you hope is going to hold the line on this issue or hold the line on that issue or promote this one um, piece of legislation. You're electing someone that you think can get the job done um, and at the end of the day can kind of square everything out. And you want a much more, I think, pragmatic, real world thinker um, than you do than the type of people that we send to Congress. Um, and I think that, you know, particularly with regard to Democratic governors, when you look at our, our history, some of our greatest um, thinkers and leaders, frankly, on both sides, but certainly with um, Democratic governors, have, have come out of the governor's ranks. And I think that that's going to continue um, to be the case because you have these pragmatic executive thinkers and not just Washington warriors. Mm hmm. And before we let you go, we have to ask you, and I, and, and I know you, you, it, it's been a little while since you've been with the Democratic National Governors Association, and you, you're, yep. you're, you're fully involved in ruckus, but we've got to ask you to pull out the crystal ball and talk a little bit about who you think some of the up-and-comers are in the state Democratic parties this year. Anything, anything jumping out at you right now, or maybe even that you're seeing on ruckus? Um, you know, I think what's, what's been interesting... Um, is some of the people that are, are running across the country that are that are just really um, doing it uh, in kind of a new contemporary online fashion. Um, I've I've been traveling around over the course of the last year, um, you know, obviously promoting ruckus uh, in different parts of the country, and I've been very encouraged by um, a the number of of young people that are seeking office, but b uh, how they're doing it, how they're embracing social media and technology, not only in terms of their fundraising, but also in terms of spreading message and and um, you know really reaching out to young people to en engage them in the political process. So I think that you know anybody that's that's really out there right now that's um, that's leveraging technology um, to promote good. Uh, democracy is somebody that's going to be very successful in the coming decade or so. You kind of sense a, a changing of the guard in that respect? I do, and I think that that's part of you know what we've seen um, with a little bit of the decline in in, uh, in partisan uh, membership. You know that people are saying I don't I don't necessarily have to go down um, you know to uh, my local Democratic Party or Republican uh, Party headquarters to uh, stuff envelopes anymore and, and kind of meet the, uh, you know, meet the, the local officials there. Um, but I can do a lot of this, you know, through Twitter and through Facebook and through my blog and hopefully through Ruckus. And, you know, that's something that I think, um, while some people, it may turn them off immediately, it's, it's much more inclusive and it's a way that um, we can reach out to everybody. You know, we always say that Internet is the great equalizer. I mean, technology is the great equalizer, and I believe that. And I, and I think that um, the power it has to better our democracy, um, you know, those, those best days are in front of us. And so I'm very hopeful from that perspective. And, you know, of course, there are probably a lot of people out there that wouldn't even know what stuffing an envelope is. So, <laughs> right. I, I remember helping my dad stuff envelopes at the local Democratic Party headquarters. I always will remember, even if that's not true for most people my age. <laughs> Ray Glenn Denning, co-founder at Ruckus Incorporated, the online organizing platform, R-U-C-K dot U-S, if you want to check it out online. Ray, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org, and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. 
It's been my pleasure. Thank you for the time. Uh huh. This is America's Democrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press interviews political analyst Jennifer Duffy, who says Democrats have an even shot at retaining control of the Senate. Very important election year, of course. As President Obama says, maybe one of, if not the most uh, critical presidential election in our lifetime. But that's not all that's at stake. Every seat in the House of Representatives at stake and some very, very important Senate races around the country which could have as much to do as uh, who wins the White House with the direction this country goes in. Jennifer Duffy covers the Senate races or uh, keeps on top of them for the Cook Political Report. She joins us in studio now as long as I've been uh, talking and covering politics in Washington. Jennifer, I've known you, and it's been uh, it's been a good run. Good to see you. It has. Nice to see you again. Yeah, and you've been on these Senate seats for, with Charlie for, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I don't really ask uh, you how many years. It, it, but. Too many. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, overall, how many Senate seats are up? Okay, there are 33 seats up this 33. time. Democrats are defending 23 of those. Republicans are defending 10. Um, so already Dem- Democrats start out with a yeah. disadvantage. I mean, it's an interesting year cycle for them because they looked like they had all the exposure in the world. They have to defend more seats. They have to defend more open seats than than Republicans do. We have seven Democratic seats in our toss up column, which means they're too close to call. We've already mm. given one seat to Republicans, the open seat in Nebraska. So it's a big exposure election for them, yeah. except that some things have happened along the way, as they normally do in elections, that give them an even shot of keeping the Senate. So today, uh, I I should know this right off the top of my head, that Democrats have a, what, two-vote advantage, or three or four? What is the advantage? Well, they they have have a three-vote advantage. Republicans would need to gain four seats if Obama wins re-election to to get the majority, three seats— if if Romney were to win and, and you'd have Ryan breaking the tie. Got it. OK. Now, we had um, yesterday we talked yesterday, uh, had a little clip here from let's start in Wisconsin. Okay. Very key state. Very, very important state. Paul Ryan, of course, from Wisconsin. President Obama uh, really needs Wisconsin. And um, Tommy Thompson. Coming up as the Republican nominee. Okay. Here he is. Uh, his little victory okay. speech. We are going to take America back. We are going to send Barack Obama. He's not sure where he's going to send him. Uh, hello, and we're hello. sending him back to Chicago. Oh, back oh, yeah. to Chicago. Oh, okay. yeah. Tommy Thomas has been around a long time. He has been around a long time, but his victory was really a best-case scenario for Republicans in this race. Um, one, he's eminently qualified. He's the longest-serving governor in Wisconsin's history. Uh, he's been secretary of the Department of Health and Human Resources. He's a known quantity. Uh, he's He certainly ran in this primary as a conservative. He didn't have much of a choice, frankly. Yeah. But he's actually viewed a little bit more moderately. He, he appeals to independent voters. Um, Republicans were pretty happy with this outcome. Uh, it's going to be a great race, though. Democrat is Congresswoman Tammy Baldwin from Madison. You know, she's gotten a free ride so far. She's been very fortunate. Um, In no primary battle, no, really. Pr- no yeah. primary battle. Uh, Republicans were too preoccupied with their own to, to pay much attention to her. Um, so this race is just getting underway. Thompson's got a bit of a lead. It's m- not outside the margin of error in most polls. This is going to be a really good race. But this is this was this is a big race for Republicans, uh, mostly because one, I think that Wisconsin now in the presidential is probably in play, certainly more than it was before Ryan's choice. So yeah. this is going to be a good race to watch. And, and coming on the backside of the uh, unsuccessful Scott Walker recall, yeah. you know, it's all that politics involved in it, too. Yeah. It's, it, it's... I, I actually pity the voters in Wisconsin. They have been subjected to more <laughs> politics than anybody deserves. So you, so you rate that one today as, as a toss up as a toss up. OK. 
Um, in Missouri, Claire McCaskill, this is one, she's one of the most targeted Democrats and, up against uh, Congressman, he's Congressman, and, is he? Yeah, Todd, he is. A, Todd, Todd Aiken. Aiken. Right. Again, uh, this is probably not the outcome Republicans needed in, in this race. Claire McCaskill is the most vulnerable incumbent up in either party. Um, you know, one, Missouri has become a redder state since she got elected in 2006. Mm-hmm. Um, she's voted with the president on some some big issues like health care reform and stimulus. And then she's got some some sort of self-inflicted wounds of uh, an, an airplane that uh, she didn't pay taxes on for years. She was also one of the most visible senators out on the stump for Barack Obama in 2008. I mean, she was absolutely. A major and, and now she, you know, now she says, please don't come see me. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, So Republicans had a a three-way primary, and um, McCaskill actually had something to do with who her opponent was, because she started airing ads um, criticizing uh, him as a solid conservative, Uh a pro-family Republican, lots of buzzwords that appeal to Republican primary voters. He was running third most of this race, Um, and so he was the candidate who didn't go negative, and and he came out on top. Republicans have a lot of work to do to so get his... So she wanted to run against him. Oh, she badly wanted to run huh. against Aiken. Well, one, he's got a record. I mean, yeah. you know, her choices were running against a former state treasurer without much of a record or a self-funding businessman uh, who's sort of in the mold of a Ron Johnson from Wisconsin. Um, no, she wanted the guy with the long congressional record of very, very conservative, um, a social conservative, almost a religious conservative, This is her candidate, and she has not let him off the mat since that primary just over a week ago. She has she she has put she's got ads up attacking him. uh, You know, uh, she's a damn good candidate. They are running a very smart campaign. This is what you know. This is where I think it is now. I mean, McCaskill went from frankly being a a definite underdog to having an even shot at winning this race. So this is a toss-up again? This is another toss-up. <laughs> uh, we got a lot of them. We got, we've got 10 of them. <laughs> no, really? Uh, I want to jump up to yeah. Connecticut because Linda McMahon, who she took a run uh, last time, lost um, to Blumenthal. Uh, she's back, beat Chris Shays in the primary. No! So now she's up... Ag- Whoa. Uh, she's up, <laughs> up against uh, Chris yeah. Murphy. Is that yeah. his name? Yeah, Chris, Chris Murphy, Democrat Chris Congress. Murphy. Right. Here she is on election night. Do you want a professional politician who believes that Washington knows best for your small business? No. 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 Do you want a career politician who's never worked in the small business? No. 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 No, never it is. So she's got a she's got a way to, ways to go to become a real fiber candidate. But anyhow, how's it look? Uh, you know, I think McMahon has a bit of a ways to go before I'm ready to to put this race in in toss up. Um, but you know, I I always, and I thought this in in 2010. I think she is underestimated as a candidate. She has spent the last 18 months. Um, revamping her image. I think her goal is to meet every single Connecticut voter. Because mm-hmm. to actually meet Linda McMahon is to, is to like Linda McMahon. Um, this is a, a better race for her in some ways because it's true. Chris Murphy, he's been in Congress for a while. He's not well known statewide. It's hard to get known statewide in Connecticut. It's a small state with expensive media markets. So it's it's an interesting race. I'm sure Democrats are going to use wrestling against her again. Yeah. Um, but her job is to make some inroads with women voters, with, with independent voters, two groups she lost badly in 2010. If she can do that, she can make this race competitive. Today you call it? Today I actually have it in likely Democrat. Likely Democrat, But huh? uh, I'm not underestimating her, and it wouldn't surprise me if this is one of those races I end up moving. Uh, North Dakota, our friend uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Kent Conrad, retiring. Mm-hmm. Uh, Heidi Heitkamp yeah. and Rick yeah. Berg. Right. Uh, this is a race that surprises us a little bit. Um, one that Democrats are still in this game because North Dakota is you would the most think it red right, states it's, right it it's, off. Uh, right? Not, it's one of the most Republican in the country, and it's become more Republican in in the last six but years. You had Byron Dorgan and Ken Conrad, right? Who were sort of populist, yes, Prairie Democrats. Um, Heidi Heitkamp, former attorney general, um, and running very much as a moderate. Um, she has criticized the president on any number of issues, including the Keystone Pipeline. 
uh, which is important mm-hmm. to North Dakota's economy. Um, and she has really made Rick Berg the creature of Washington uh, and, and somebody who has kind of lost touch. Now, remember, he got elected to this seat in 2010, so he hasn't been here long. But it's um, Is he a Tea Party Republican? Not really, but he's a pretty conservative Republican. Um, and the, the, the benefit to Berg in this race is that congressional seat is at large. They only have one. Oh, so he does right. represent the entire state. Um, but really, if, if things were going the way Republicans thought, they, they would have put this race away by now. And not only haven't they put it away, but but Heidkamp has a real shot here. So it is it is in play. I've heard good things about her. I haven't yeah. I haven't met her. Uh, how would you rate this one? Uh, this, too, is a toss-up. Another toss-up. I gave right. you a list of toss-ups. <laughs> <laughs> We've got them. Jennifer Duffy's in studio with us. We'll continue to go through some of the important states, maybe get to your state. you got a question for Jennifer or a comment, 866-55-PRESS. You don't have to agree with the Cook Political Report's ratings, uh, but you better have some good evidence to challenge them, too. Uh, you can follow their uh, all their other races, too, by the way, at Cook Political, cookpolitical.com. We'll be back with Jennifer Duffy. Talking Senate races with uh, Jennifer Duffy from the Cook Political Report. Jennifer, let's try to get through as many of the rest of these as we can um, and then maybe take a couple of calls. Uh, Massachusetts. Let's go to New England. Massachusetts. This is, I think, the race in the country that sucks up the most uh, Absolutely. Uh, political yep. oxygen. Yep. You've got Elizabeth Warren, uh, who, who started the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, versus Scott Brown, who won a special election, first Republican. Uh, for re-election? Yep. To, first uh, time? Yep. First time. Um, an incredible amount of money has been raised in this race. Uh, I think Warren's raised about $25 million. They have a pledge to keep Super PACs out, which mm-hmm. has so far been very successful. Um, and, I, you know, I think that there is a, a the conventional wisdom is a little bit off here that this is really Warren's race to lose. One, because Massachusetts is such a blue state and, and she is really not just energized Democrats in Massachusetts, but energized right. Democrats across totally, the country. Totally. However, Massachusetts is a quirky place. It's pretty blue. Uh, on the other hand, most of his voters are registered as independents. And hmm. Hmm. Um, there's a sort of brand of Democrat there that really likes Scott Brown, tends to be blue collar, um, you know, voted for Ronald Reagan uh, once or twice. And and they, you know, they'd rather have a beer with Scott Brown. There is a path to victory for Brown. It's not easy, but it's doable. And you rate it today as As a toss up. As a toss up (laughs) again. While we're in New England, Maine is really, uh, I mean, Olympia Snow stepping down. This would go Mm. any way, right? Because you've got... it three could. way, a three it, way. It's a three way race, but it's it. We have this in the toss up column with a long explanation. There is a clear front runner in this race, Angus King, former governor. He's running as an independent. What he has said is that he will not declare a party until after the election, and if he can figure out how <laughs> not to declare one at all, that would be preferable. But I think the reality is you need a you need to caucus with a party to get a committee assignment. Right. Uh, who you can have lunch with on Tuesday, right? <laughs> when, when the parties meet. So he's going to wait. And he has two criteria that will make his decision. The first is what's best for Maine. That would mean being in the majority party to me. And, and, and uh-huh. the second the second criteria is interesting. It's um, what each party's definition of caucus is. You know, he he has already said, you know, I'm not a team player here. You know, I'm not going to vote the way you want me to vote. I'm going to do what's best for Maine. And he really wants to come shake Washington up a little bit and shake the Senate up. Um, So we may not know his decision for a week or two after the election. And if if the outcome of the Senate is as close as I think it's going to be, he could be the guy deciding who's in the majority. He could really, wow, wow, what power he's going to have. Uh, Let's take a quick call from Joe out in Salt Lake City. Utah's a state we didn't have on our list, but Mm -hmm. let's find out. Hey, Joe, good morning. Yeah, I got problems here with uh, the Senate run with Hatch. I mean, we tried to get him out in the primary. (laughs) Right. Yes, it didn't work very well. No, I was at the primary that night. I went in as as like uh, non-committed to either party. I was told to go sit in the back of the room and shut up, and I had no opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Joe, for the call. So you told, I mean, Orrin Hatch. Uh, Ar- you know, Orrin Hatch, his, his, the real trouble for him was in, in the primary. The, in, yeah. Well, it's, was, it's convention state Con- first. I'm sorry, the convention. And sure, I have sure. to say, I have never seen anybody run 
a campaign like Hatch did. He deserved to win that primary. The, they worked hard. They they learned from everything that Bob Bennett did wrong in 2010. And in a presidential year with Romney at the top of the ticket, I think the general election is is tough for Democrats here. I have yeah, this I, in the solid Republican yeah, column. Look, I, I, I think you're right. It, it's the reddest of the red states. So yeah. let's just write that one off. But next door in the state of Nevada... Yeah. Uh, Dean Heller is now the senator. He right. was appointed to replace John Ensign, Shelley mm-hmm. uh, um, Berkeley, right? right. Uh, a congresswoman from Las Vegas, mm-hmm. uh, challenging him. How's that? How's that one look? You know, I, you know, this is a toss-up race that that's actually taken some twists and turns in the last couple of weeks, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the next round of polling here. Uh, congresswoman Berkeley uh, is now under investigation by the Ethics Committee uh, mm-hmm. for. Um, essentially conflict of interest, uh, pursuing legislation and some federal regulatory action that directly benefited her husband, who is a doctor. Um, And with that charge out there now, how much does this change uh, this race? You know, she's going to win Las Vegas. Voters know her there. Um, She's done well there. It's the most Democratic part of the state. It's also the most populous. But boy, the places that Democrats have tried to make inroads in lately, places like Elko and Reno, um, this is where she's got to do well, and this investigation hurts her there. She's an unbelievably aggressive candidate. You know, they announced Paul Ryan as VP choice on Saturday, and by Tuesday she had a Save Medicare statewide tour up and running. Um, you know, she is going to do everything she can to win this race. But I but I think that, uh, it, you know, this is it got a little tougher for Democrats. All right. We haven't talked about Montana. haven't talked yeah. about New Mexico. Yeah. No time because uh, time for one more question. And I want to ask you, and you just sort of touched on okay. it. To what extent do you think, if at all, the nomination of Paul Ryan will affect these Senate races around the country? You know, I, I've been reading a lot in the last few days about how it's changed uh, the landscape, and I think it's that's premature to say that. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One, in several of these Senate races, we've already seen Democrats have been using, quote, the Ryan budget and Medicare, Medicare. including in television advertising, right. well before Ryan was selected. Does it make a difference now that there's, quote, a face mm-hmm. that you can put on, on these proposals? It's too early to tell, but I, I will say that there are states that I'm watching very carefully because they're going to be, to me, the leading edge of of that. And it's North Dakota, Florida, Senate mm-hmm, race in Florida, and Nevada. Oh. Um, and, and I think that if you see Republicans start to falter there under these attacks, then there is the possibility that this becomes a nationalized campaign around this. But I think we, it is way too early to tell. All right. Again, nobody knows this stuff better than you, Jennifer. So Thank grateful you. for your coming in this morning. Uh, our best to Charlie yeah. Cook and your other Thank colleagues you. at the Cook Political Report, which you can follow again at cookpolitical.com. See you again soon. Thanks. Thank you. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Ira Shapiro, Ray Glenn Denning, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to America.